that's not your style because you know you had <laughs> just done this really pop kind of music video with Max Steamy from uh, you know Grey's Anatomy and so that was like a completely different you know turnaround from your music style so tell me a little bit about that journey like how what brought you say I want to sing and then how you kind of pivoted into this different style of music Oh, wow. That's a that's a big question to unpack. Really, it was up to, you know, God, the universe, whatever you want to whatever you want to say um, to decide my fate for me. I don't think that I really decided it. I think that it was really a matter of, you know, putting myself out there in every single way artistically that I possibly could. And then one path just fell into place. So I, you know, I started performing, um, my, one of my mentors when I was younger, um, was a woman named Corky Hale and she is a piano player for Billie Holiday and the harpist and her husband, uh, was also an amazing mentor. And he, uh, is Mike Stoller of Lieber and Stoller who wrote every famous Elvis song that there is Smokey Joe's cafe. Um, so those two really took me under their wing and, she was like, are you out of your damn mind? Stop doing pop. You need to do jazz. <laughs> and so she started producing my first jazz gigs. And man, was she was she on to something? Because then uh, the manager from PMJ came to my show um, up in uh, Herb Alpert's Bel Air uh, vibrato and um, said, you know what? You, you know, you should really be performing with my... Uh, with my client Scott Bradley um, from Postmodern Jukebox, and I had never heard of them before, but you know, I googled them and I was like, "Holy shit!" You know, people are this is this is really amazing. So I flew to New York and and recorded a video with Scott Bradley, and then that ch one trip changed my whole life and also the trajectory of my career, kind of forever. You know, really started going into a, a world that I never even a knew existed and B was even possible for, for cabaret and for jazz music. Um, you know, playing, like you said, Radio City Musical <laughs> with, with a, with a cabaret, you know, vaudeville burlesque show is just, I never thought that that was even a, a reality for me. So, so to answer your question, yeah, I mean, it all started from, you know, me just being an indecisive idiot, not knowing what to do with my life <laughs> and then it working out for the best. That is amazing. Did you, yeah. was that the time when you were inspired to write your new album that just dropped or did you write this before or was it a pandemic? Oh album tell me a little bit about you know the dead dance and what does it mean really yeah. um all years you know people need to hear music and they need to have something to feel happy and to feel you know to, to have a soundtrack to their lives right now and for me i called it the dead dance uh because for me that song and and that whole album is about making light out of darkness you know and for me that's always been what music and especially cabaret is about, you know, because cabaret, obviously its its roots are 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 quite political um and and very dark. Um cabaret in its infancy was certainly something that was used as a mechanism to sort of, you know, take the the most horrifying circumstances that people were going through um at that time, especially in Germany, um, yeah. you know, during the Weimar era, um, after the um after the recession and, uh, and make it into something beautiful, right. To take just these horrible circumstances and make them into something funny or light or interesting or beautiful. And, and I always loved that idea. Um, so that's the reason why I called it, uh, why I called it the dead dance, uh, just cause, you know, trying to, trying to see the light in, in all this bullshit that we're living through. <laughs> that's, yeah. It felt yeah. appropriate. A last question. Um, before we regretfully part, because I could have you here for two hours. Always. Um, in the words of your dad, mm -hmm. if, if there was something that your dad taught you, some sort of a mantra or word of wisdom or something that has been your guiding light, mm -hmm. you know, through the ups and the downs, what would be something that you remember of your dad saying to you that has been your companion in every moment of your life? My mom has has taught me a lot of things about the way that my father thought and the way that he felt and lived his life. You know, through her, I've been able to 
experience those lessons that he wasn't here to give me. And I think probably the biggest lesson and the biggest comfort um, that I ever got from my father is it's never too late. It's never too late. Ever, 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 ever. My father was almost 40 when he was cast in his first movie. Uh, before that, he was a lifeguard. He had his own talk show. He was in the war. <laughs> he fought in World War II. He had been married and divorced, had children. He had a, a theater that went under. He had lived so many lives before, you know, and, and honestly, I kind of, kind of, I see that in myself as well, because I've had such a, you know, a journey that hasn't been linear. Um, and I think that a lot of people are like that. I think that there are more people than not that start out doing one thing and then they go do something completely different and then they do this and they do that. And they, at least they have the courage to keep going and seeing what it is that really works for them. And you know, it wasn't until my father was in his 40s that he even really became the Telly Savalas that anybody knew. And, you know, even in your 40s, it's like if you're in your 50s, your 60s, I, I always hear, especially from women um, that I know that say, oh, I shouldn't be wearing this. I'm too old for this. Or I'm like, bullshit. Like, what, what, where does it say any of this? And this is something that, you know, I've even had to take into my career as a musician and as, as a performer, because you always, always feel, and I have to remind myself always, you know, it's like, well, you know, the minute you hit 35 or something, whenever that happens, it's, it's going to be the end of my career. Or it's, you know, okay. when you are this, it's, it's over, or you get to a certain weight or you get to a certain this. And it's like, there are no rules and there are certainly no rules anymore. And that's a really lovely thing and and my dad you know having so many different i to think of that in myself as something that was a curse because i just couldn't make up my damn mind and i was just so in, in and i realized actually that it's a blessing because it it you know it takes courage to keep going and to keep trying and to keep experimenting and to keep you know and also to you know give the big middle finger to anybody that says that it's too late for you to do anything or it's, you know, you're too old for this. Or it's like he became a sex symbol at 50. I mean, it's just not, you know, there are no rules and he was never a person who the rules apply to. So we think that that for me has always been not only a comfort for me, but for my friends as well, when they are in those places in their career where they're like, I'm not where I thought I'd be by 30 or I'm not where I thought I'd be by 40 or whatever these age milestones. It's just like, look at my dad, look at my dad. He had a, you know, he had a, a 18 lives that he lived before he became the famous, you know, actor Telly Savalas. There's no rules, you know, it happens when it happens and whatever is going to happen is going to happen in its own time, you know? So I think that, if, if there's anything that's brought me a lot of comfort from the way he lived his life, it's just, you know, it isn't even what he said. It's just how he lived it. He lived it, just didn't give a shit. Just did it, you know? He was always so much less afraid to not do it than to do it.